responsive reading. Now is the time for turning. For leaves, birds, animals, this turning comes instinctively. Let us turn, lest we will be trapped forever in yesterday's ways. Good morning. I'm Marie Maherpenny. And I'm Judith Keenitz. We co-chair Fountain Street Church's Women's Association, which began in 1890 and which has played a significant role in the church for many decades. All women of the church are considered members of, and men are also welcome. <laughs> because we no longer request dues, we are doing more fundraising to cover the costs of our ongoing projects, of furnishing and maintaining the kitchen, coordinating memorial receptions with the help of the districts, and financially supporting projects of other church groups. We are a working group and we want to first give you the dates of our three fundraisers for this church year. A sale of art, antiques and collectibles on Sunday, October 19th. Our annual trinkets and treasure sale on Sunday, December 15th. And an Irish soup lunch complete with Irish music on Sunday, March the 15th. I was raised in a fairly conservative Lutheran tradition and for the first two years of my college experience at a Lutheran liberal arts university, I planned on going into religious youth leadership training. Several years ago, I retired from 27 years of college teaching for a total of 34 years in public education. I was raised in a small village in Ireland and attended Catholic church. I moved to San Francisco when I was 22 and lived there for 12 years, during which time I met my husband, Lance. We married in Ireland and lived there for seven years, running our family pub. We moved to Grand Rapids in 2006. I came to this church as a single mom with a four-year-old son in the mid-70s, and I've been a member here for over 30 years. And I married into the Penny family, that has been active in this church for almost 60 years. Fountain Street seemed a natural place to raise our three girls, ages 11, nine, and eight. Our children were or are being raised in character school. My son and daughter-in-law who live in Washington, DC, are raising my grandchildren, ages seven and five, as free thinkers. Our children are being raised in character school with welcoming hands, loving hearts, and open minds. I observe in everyday experiences that they practice what they learn. One of their favorite parts of character school is the community project done monthly on Social Action Sunday. Here at Fountain Street Church, we come from many different religious traditions, backgrounds, beliefs, and non-beliefs. We believe, believe that doubt and belief are free to work together. To find and be who I am in an ever-increasing, complex, stressed world and nation is almost overwhelming to me. But in this place and in this community, I find a space to carve and create a life that makes a difference. Too, too often we experience a world and live in a nation where data is a pollution problem, where hypocrisy can substitute for being authentic, where the suppression of expression and the oppression of women and children is often mandated by religiosity, where blatant racism gets a free pass, where corporate and personal greed is seen as good, where the dying of our planet is denied. Where evolutionary biology is erased from textbooks. Where transparency, oversight, and accountability is ignored. 
and where narcissistic entitlement replaces empathy. We do not want this kind of life for our children and our grandchildren. We want them to feel free to think realistically, to feel humanly, to work for social justice and the common good, and to find hope and the magic in the heart of the universe. We want this for ourselves as well. We find that hope in this church community, and we work to sustain that hope. If you are here for the first time, perhaps from visiting us during Art Prize, or you are a sometime visitor, a new member, or a longtime member, welcome to Fountain Street Church. Thank you.
In case you didn't notice, the music uh, that you just heard and that the choir gave you comes from early Euro-American Protestant uh, singing. Before there were choirs, the idea that there would be a choir in church is a relatively new phenomenon. In fact, this building here was not built with a choir in mind. That's why the choir loft is so snug. It, Baptists and others thought of choirs as being a little too high church. No, no, I'm not kidding. Uh, I'm delighted that we've overcome that reluctance. But in the 19th century, uh, congregational singing was the only song that went on, but most people didn't know how to read music. And so someone came up with the idea not of, of teaching people to recognize the notes by using different shapes up and down the, the staff. So one would be round, another would be diamond shape, another would be square, another would be uh, triangular. And it created music in that style you just heard, which is fairly simple. Pentatonic might be a way to describe it. It feels almost like Aaron Copland because he borrowed some of that tradition. Simple gifts is similar to it. It's called shape note singing. And in early America in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s and beyond, entertainments in the evening would consist of people coming together and singing four-part harmonies by looking at the shaped notes. I think we've lost something as a culture that we can no longer sing together quite so eagerly as we did maybe 150 years ago. The choir will affirm to you that the act of singing together is a profoundly spiritual one. And when we do it, we feel ourselves lifted up in ways that we may not otherwise enjoy. So thank you to Gary and to Wendy Kapolka and always to the choir for reminding us of the voice we have inside us that perhaps should find its way out. I have a few passages to yeast, put yeast into this dough. Let's see where they go. Uh, yesterday was, in fact, Yom Kippur, and there is a passage from Isaiah that is read there. It's a day of fasting, 24 hours of no food or drink, and most of it spent in synagogue. And in the middle of the afternoon, by the time you're really hungry and really thirsty, they read this passage from Isaiah. Is such the fast I desire, a day for men and women to starve their bodies? Is it bowing the head like a bulrush and lying in sackcloth and ashes? Do you call that a fast, a day when the Lord is favorable? No. This is the fast I desire, to unlock the fetters of wickedness and untie the cords of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to break off every yoke. It is to share your bread with the hungry and to take the wretched into your home when you see the naked to clothe them and not to ignore your own kin. Many generations later, Walter Cronkite was being interviewed and he had the following comment to say, I think being a liberal in the true sense is being non-doctrinaire, non-dogmatic, non-committed to a cause, but examining each case on its own merits. The radio personality and wise woman Krista Tippett observes, fundamentalism and liberalism and terrorism, these are labels that only tell us partial truths. We must use them humbly, guardedly, as Niebuhr would say, aware of the limitations of our own vision. Let me read that again. Aware of the limitations of our own vision and of our own capacity for misunderstanding and self-deception. 
And finally, Swami Vivekananda, one of the early exponents of, Amer of modern Hindu practice in the West, said, many people in the name of what may be called religious liberalism may be seen feeding their idle curiosity with a continuous succession of different ideals. Religion is with these people a sort of intellectual opium eating, and there it ends. My. Were I to talk about a short, energetic man at the turn of the century with restless energy and a notable mustache, you would be just in summoning a picture of Theodore Roosevelt to mind. I'm thinking of someone who was like that, who was an historian of note in his time, of a, a policeman from moment to moment, a journalist and a power broker, but I'm not thinking of Theodore Roosevelt because I am thinking of, well, I thinking of Alfred Wesley Wishart, who arrived here as the minister of this church in 1907. They were almost contemporaries. Wishart was only seven years younger, in fact. They were men of their moment, of a similar spirit. In tracing the evolution of this church, of Fountain Street Church, from rock-ribbed stalwart Baptists to loudly and proudly liberal, it is hard to avoid seeing the influence of its preachers. But as I noted a month ago, the liberal spirit was born here, began here in the people themselves, in their generous hearted nature that was true to the forgiving spirit of Jesus, if not to the judging spirit of Christ. Back when liberal really did mean generous, we were liberal in the kind-hearted sense of the word. And when John L. Jackson arrived saying that we must extend our heart beyond our immediate circle of kin to those who are oppressed, to those who were hungry, to those who were, we were, who were naked, we did that too. We became liberal in the sense of liberating those who were imprisoned by poverty and ignorance. And then John Herman Randall arrived questioning the religious dogmas of the past and saying that they were inadequate to the stormy present and we were ready to take on the last meaning of liberal to deliberate, to think anew about what is most, what most would consider to be received in unchangeable truth. By the time John Herman Randall had left, there were three kinds of liberalism at work in this place, that generous-hearted kindliness that forgave the flaws of others, the foundation of all liberalism, in my opinion. The liberational liberalism that saw the plight of others as being something we should work to relieve. And finally, the intellectual liberality that questioned all the received dogmas and asked if they were still adequate. So in 1907, when Wishart arrived, Fountain Street Church had literally been reborn three times. People say that you know, when they ask about us, are you Christian? And I say, I don't know. What do you mean by Christian? And they say, well, have you been born again? And I say, that happens to me every blessed day. But the church itself was, it's, well, it gave birth to itself almost three different times. So in 1907, in some ways, it was like a newborn child, not very accomplished at using these newly found gifts of generosity, liberation, and deliberation. And Wishart would be the one to put us through our paces, to create the institution that housed the heart. This is where his Teddy Roosevelt nature flourished. And yes, they are similar people. He was like his predecessor and predecessor before that, a graduate of the University of Chicago Divinity School, a hotbed of heresy even in 1890. And he applied his zeal, not only here, but in churches back east where he began. He fought against corruption and gambling and prostitution and government graft. He even convinced some members of his church in Trenton to buy him a newspaper so that he could write thrilling editorials against the political machine. Between social campaigns, he wrote books including a short history of monks and monasteries that you can still find on Amazon if you wish to buy it. He continued his muscular habit here as well, beginning the long, illustrious series of great speakers. He debated Clarence Darrow in this space, not in this 
church, the other building was present, but on this ground. And Winston Churchill came here at his invitation between his bouts of fame when he was persona non grata in England, but it saw what was happening overseas. Philip Buchan, a member of this church for many years, wrote the author of our church history. You can find a copy if you ask me in the office. He focuses on Wishart's doctrinal liberalism, which was novel, I have to admit. But my predecessor, David Rankin, who also wrote about these ministers in his small series, was more influenced or more taken with his influence over institutions. Wishart knew how to influence men, and I mean that in the good old boy sense of the word, that he knew who the power brokers were, and he knew how to influence them, and he liked doing that. He liked being a mover and shaker. He knew how to organize people to do things. He was a sleeves rolled up sort of fellow that the church had not seen before, for whom the institutional mechanisms of the church were to be strengthened and used. Wishart, by example and encouragement and sometimes sheer determination, made this church into a liberal institution and not just a place for liberal conversation. By the time Wishart died, and he died while serving this church, this was both the most liberal and the most prominent Protestant church in the city. No small accomplishment to make it that different from others and also that desirable for the important people to attend. Now I want to back up a little bit. Not from the, from the end of his ministry to 1914, just because that would be a hundred years ago and also the anniversary of the great war that broke out. It's overshadowed by the war that followed it, but at the time it was a cataclysmic event. And Wishart enlisted, many ministers enlisted in the First World War. And they went off overseas or served here, something we can scarcely imagine today. That world that he lived in seems so far away now when ministers could take six months leave to go serve in the armed services. Remarkable. But at that moment, especially after the war when the Allies prevailed, it, it appeared for that moment that democracy and progress and science, all the things liberals love, were triumphant. Fountain Street Church was then a brand new building with an enormous steeple or bell tower. As Europe smoked in ruin, America was growing like crazy and big downtown churches were influential and their pulpits rocked with thrilling preachers promising a world transformed. This was the beginning of the American century, and for a few years, the progress of liberalism on all fronts seemed not only possible, but inevitable. But of course, a century later, we know that's not true. A dozen years after the first great war came the second greater war. A dozen years after that, African Americans were finally handing down stinging indictments of three centuries of racism. A dozen years after that, we were still mired in a war of occupation in far-off Vietnam between 1918 and 1968. Fifty years, everything liberalism promised fell apart. Now, back when I was a boy, I went to summer camp. Did any of you go to summer camp? And of course, that was in the days before iPods and Wi-Fi and boom boxes. So our entertainment were campfire songs, right? You'd sit around the campfire and some counselor would teach you very silly songs. But I'll bet you remember some of them even now. And the one I'm remembering this morning is the one called Deep and Wide. Deep and wide, our fountains flowing deep and wide. Then you repeat it again, and it had gestures. Deep and wide, deep and wide. We are, there's a fountain flowing deep and wide. And you do it again. Deep and, you know it, don't you? Deep and wide, there's a fountain flowing deep and wide. And then you'd leave off one of the words, you go, and wide. And, and eventually it'd be nothing but the intervening words. 
And this came, this oddly, it came to mind as I'm thinking about our history. Because I want to know whether or not liberal religion is both deep and wide. The fact that it talks about a fountain seems even more appropriate to us. Yesterday was Yom Kippur, as I noted earlier, the day of atonement, a solemn day of confession and contemplation of our never-ending ability as human beings to mess things up. So it's a good time for us to confess. I will confess on your behalf, on our behalf, liberalism, the liberalism of 1914 failed. It was inadequate to the stormy present. It was and probably is still a little too faith-based in its confidence in human nature and in the capacity of technology to deliver us from all of our evils. Franklin Roosevelt supposedly said that a liberal is someone with both feet firmly planted in the clouds. We are guilty of that to some extent, we liberals. It can also be a little too open-minded when well, as someone said, don't, let your, don't be so open-minded that your brains fall out. Or as Robert Frost observed, liberals are those who cannot even take their own side in an argument. <laughs> They're so busy understanding the other point of view. Let's confess that liberalism is not the be-all and end-all of ideologies. It has limits and flaws which I contend are no worse than those of other ideologies, no, certainly no worse than the dogmatisms of religion or politics or even dogmatic atheism. I think the real peril is not whether one is liberal or conservative, it's the dogmatic quality with which we hold either one. The allure of a clear, unified system of truth is very real. The reality is wild and woolly and messy and a little bit scary. Who would not want a system that explained everything in nice, orderly fashion? But as the Baltimore cynic H.L. Mencken, no liberal by the way, once put it, for every complex problem there is a clear, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. That's why I prefer Walter Cronkite's admonition that liberalism, in a true sense, is being non-doctrinaire, non-dogmatic, non-committed to a cause, but examining each case on its own merits. And yet there is that risk of, on the one hand, on the other hand, until you make no decision at all. You just hem and haw and hem and haw until someone else has made up your mind for you. When I was a young minister among the Unitarians, my my family background, three generations back. We spoke of religious liberalism. Let me say that again, religious liberalism. And my parents being grammatical fusspots made me realize that religious liberalism is wrong because we're not, because that means we would be religious about being liberal, the religious being the adjective and liberalism being the noun. And I wasn't religious about being liberal. I was liberal about being religious. It's exactly the reverse. That's why I prefer to speak of liberal religion because making liberal the adjective modifies the religion part, the virtues of liberality, its generosity, its care, its encompassing, its deliberate quality modify, I would say even mollify the, the conservative dogmatisms that all religions are prey to. What I'm trying to say, and forgive me because my cold is clouding my head this morning, I need the breadth of liberalism, but I also need the depth of conservatism, the justice of the liberal but the responsibility of the conservative, the freedom of the liberal to think for myself, and the skepticism of the conservative, lest I trust myself to be infallible. I think we all want those things. We want to be both deep and wide. We want our religion to be both deep and wide. 
The passage from Isaiah comes, as I mentioned earlier, during the afternoon hours of the Yom Kippur service, after many hours without food or drink, many hours standing in prayer. It's meant to be arduous. And it is intended, when you say it, to impress upon the people the sufferings of those who cannot eat every day, who are in prison every day, who are poor every day, to kindle some sympathy for them. It's intended to impress upon them that holiness is not about pleasing God and being pure and perfect, but about being good and wise with our fellow creatures. No, this is the fast I desire, says Isaiah, to unlock the fetters of wickedness, untie the bonds of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to break off every oppression, to share your bread with the hungry. If you are at Yom Kippur services and you're there, it is a humbling moment when you realize how much work there is yet to be done. Sages in the Jewish tradition say that we are supposed to press down upon our egos on Yom Kippur, suppress ourselves, lower and humble ourselves. The holiest day of the Jewish year is a solemn day, one of profound, meaning deep, humility. A word which comes from a Latin root that means dirt or soil. To be humbled is to be pressed into the ground. Dust thou art, and dust thou shalt become. But unfortunately, humility is not popular in church these days. Not anywhere, in fact. We're America. We are confident. We are sure of ourselves. We have self-esteem. We admire leaders that seem to know who they are and where they're going. Churches overflow when the message is uplifting, prosperity, power, holiness, self-doubt, self-criticism, confession are, well, they're unpleasant, and who wants to go to church to hear those things? And yet, and yet, if we want a religion of depth, of meaning and purpose, to feel that we belong to the universe in a significant way, to feel that we have a role to play. It is not by lifting us up to heaven, but by pressing ourselves down to the earth that we will find the depth we look for. You cannot scale the depths. You must go down to the bottom. If we wish to know our true humanity in all its glory, We must claim, demand, and carry our profound humility first. This is the liberal spiritual path, not one of endless promise and progress, but of constant effort and struggle and self-doubt. That's what we need to complement the breadth of our liberality, the depth of humility. It is a challenge that the liberal church in all its forms is still waiting to embrace. But how do we walk this path, you're asking? What is this path of humility you're talking about? Well, I've run out of time, and the answer is not short. But if I were to hazard a guess for you right this moment, The leadership, the guidance, the wisdom we need is about 12 steps long. May these words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be found true in thy sight. Thou who art my rock and my redeemer.